Welcome to today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. Today we commence a four-week series on the subject, South Africa, the politics of apartheid. These programs have emanated from a symposium that's being conducted at North Idaho College and we hope you'll be with us for uh, this entire month when we deal with this very, very important subject. We're very fortunate to have on the first program today uh, Dr. Alan Weinstein, who is president of the Center for Democracy in Washington, D.C. Our guest has a long list of credentials that time will not permit. I will simply say that he is a professor of history at Boston University in addition to uh, coordinating and uh, heading that center. He has published in the field of international affairs and a number of areas as well as some domestic issues in the United States. He is also the former executive editor of the Washington Quarterly and was also the creator and the moderator of Inside Washington PBS production, which was outstanding for a number of years. Uh, we're so happy <coughs> to have you on our program and we look forward to discussing this important subject of the basic history and overview of South Africa with you today, Dr. Weinstein. It's good to be here, Dr. Stewart. I'm also happy to welcome to the program to assist in the question today, first of all, is Dr. Del Soden, who has a PhD in history from the University of Washington, is a member of the faculty at North Idaho College and Mr. Richard Snyder, who has his degrees in anthropology from UCLA and is affiliated with our Department of Anthropology. And I would invite Dr. Soden to commence the questioning. Dr. Weinstein, uh, this morning you spoke of a number of uh, current South African leaders. Uh, could you take just a few moments and, and uh, try to define the difference between uh, Nelson Mandela, <coughs> and Desmond Tutu, and uh, uh, Chief of the Zulus, uh, Gacha Butelezi? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Briefly, <coughs> Nelson Mandela is, of course, the uh, uh, head of the African National Congress, but uh, not an active head. He's been in prison uh, for a quarter century or more, but considered very much the spiritual leader, not only of the African National Congress, the uh, movement which is directing the insurgency uh, in South Africa, uh, split in its leadership between uh, non-communist and com communist elements at this point, uh, receiving support both from the East and from the West, uh, in effect poised uh, uh, in a rather ambivalent manner in terms of what its plans are should it ever achieve power in South Africa. Virtually every major black figure of consequence and most white leaders with the exception of the government have argued that the first step toward a uh, serious negotiation of South Africa's problems uh, and serious moves toward reform would uh, require the freeing of Nelson Mandela. Uh, this has not happened. Uh, President Botha's uh, nationalist government, Afrikaner government, has uh, steadfastly refused to free Mandela. He is uh, obviously a hero and a martyr to his people. Uh, Desmond Tutu, Bishop Tutu, uh, won the Nobel Prize, uh, the, the uh, Peace Prize recently. Uh, few years ago, uh, is the uh, preeminent uh, churchman, black churchman of South Africa, black or white churchman, uh, a force for moderate change, uh, a person who has been advocating peaceful, nonviolent solutions to these problems. But it has become, you've seen that we've, we've all witnessed this on American television day after day after day, under the pressures of uh, the uh, destabilizing of the black townships and the increasing suppression of government. Uh, increasingly more militant in his t in his uh, responses. Uh, Chief Budalezi uh, is touring the United States uh, as we talk, uh, an advocate of uh, uh, continued American investment in uh, South Africa, the leader of the six million Zulus, uh, uh, heads a movement in Kata, which is currently experimenting with white authorities in Natal toward the creation of a state uh, uh, a biracial or multiracial legislature. Uh, it is fair to say, I think, that uh, he is considered a, uh, uh, a far too moderate figure by the African National Congress people. I just wanted to ask again, do you, you were mentioning that toward the end of your address this morning that uh, you believe that the United States should, should pursue an aggressive uh, <coughs> policy of, of uh, engagement with, with uh, uh, South African leaders who who are looking to create a, a biracial society or interested in the transition between our, the current South African regime and, and uh, 
uh, a potentially uh, different kind of regime in the future is, is Sheep Butelezi one of these people or, or Absolutely. are we? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We have, one, and it's, we're talking about a multiracial society because we have, uh, what, 72 percent of South Africa's uh, uh, black African, uh, uh, 14, 15 percent white, uh, 10 percent mixed race or colored, to use their word, and uh, the remainder Asians. Um, Chief Budalese, the uh, African National Congress leaders, the uh, very dynamic new labor movement that has uh, been organized in South Africa that uh, brought out two million workers uh, in a protest strike uh, earlier this year, the uh, newly energized business community which has begun to oppose apartheid uh, very strongly, the Progressive Federalist Party, the leading opposition party within the white uh, legislature of South Africa, 26 seats out of a 166. The, the South Africa is is filled with people with whom the United States should be pursuing an aggressive policy of, uh, of discussions, uh, not least of which is the government, in effect, uh, so that I don't uh, preclude any of these groups uh, in what we all hope will be uh, a more peaceful transition toward a, a, a serious multiracial society, a democratic multiracial society that now exists. One more quick question. Sure. Uh, if we're in a situation where Chief Udalese <coughs> is saying don't disinvest and Desmond Tutu is saying uh, disinvest, right. uh, how does the United States deal with, the, with, with that kind well, of we Well, we have policies on record in that regard uh, that the Congress has passed, the President has signed. We, uh, for the, whether one agrees or disagrees with specifics of the policies, they, they are American policies. Uh, I don't think we have to establish a means test on disinvestment or sanctions in terms of whom we talk to. Uh, we will be talking, remember, among others, to people within the ANC who have been engaged uh, in some pretty violent stuff over the last uh, uh, decade or so. We'll be talking to people in the government who, will be, who have been engaged in some pretty brutal repression uh, over the, uh, the period since 1948 when statutory apartheid was uh, created. Uh, that's the situation. Those are the facts on the ground. We have to talk to them all. Richard Snyder. I was absolutely fascinated this morning when uh, you referred to apartheid as, as a defensive measure mm -hmm. by uh, mm -hmm. a white minority and also to the uh, African Defense League, I think it is called, uh, a, a perhaps Nazi-oriented, <laughs> and I use the word loosely, or fascist kind of uh, defense as well of, of, uh, of a position mm -hmm. that's under attack. Uh, could you tell us about why apartheid is is a defensive well, action and, and the relationship to this, this defense league? I think what I said, Dr. Snyder, was that in 1948 and 9, when the nationalist government uh, took over and the, the laws uh, that, uh, were put into effect, the first laws that govern the, the statutory apartheid system, um, this reflected, as you look back upon it, uh, the very clear recognition on the part of those uh, the people who ran that government that uh, they were going to become an increasingly embattled white uh, minority intent upon total control at a time when the winds of change, to quote Harold Macmillan's phrase, were sweeping Africa. So although the system has been profoundly aggressive in its treatment of black Africans, uh, in its inception it did not necessarily reflect the uh, the psychological and cultural health of the Afrikaner, but uh, his defensiveness. Uh, as for this new African resistance movement that I think you're referring to, this uh, is a, still a relatively small movement. Uh, five or 10,000 uh, extreme rightist South Africans who wander about uh, in dress-ups, uh, uh, playing Goebbels and Hitler and uh, the like, and then giving the Nazi salutes and breaking up efforts even by the nationalist ministers to hold rallies. Uh, they're hoping, obviously, to become a parliamentary opposition in the next election, and the nationalists, uh, I'm told that uh, Prime Minister Bota and several of his cabinet members fear that they might, but for the moment, I think they uh, are a uh, relatively minor threat contained by the uh, more responsible uh, uh, mm. uh, right-wingers or nationalists around them. But you see them yeah. as, uh, as an attempt at political power, uh, perhaps a parallel yeah. between uh, Hitler's original uh, brown shirt kind of movement in which he was beginning to well, work. Well, uh, we, uh, we can't preclude their growth because obviously as the African National uh, uh, Congress grows in support and you, you begin to watch what could be a military polarization of the country into these paramilitary groupings on the, on the right, fearing that the government isn't doing enough for them, uh, that uh, that's a possibility. The, str the tougher the government sounds, the more it pulls the rug out from underneath these uh, 
weekend dress-up types who mm -hmm. wander about uh, playing at, uh, at being junior equivalents of the Nazis. Dr. Weinstein, I have somewhat of an involved question, which I usually do. I'm sure <laughs> no more involved than these, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure that many of the viewers who yeah. are going to be with us throughout this series uh, who do not have a background in the subject would really like to have a clear definition and explanation of apartheid. Uh, I know historically it's been around a long time, and part of it was through tradition, custom, and it's been sanctioned with legislation, and particularly in the 40s and 50s. <coughs> would you take a little time to explain to our viewers how that operates within the South? You've already identified the four major groups in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the first part of my question is, uh, really is what is apartheid as it operates in South Africa? Well, historically, apartheid is, uh, <coughs> which, which uh, I'm, I'm not an Afrikaner linguist, but I'm told it means apartness or separateness, segregation. Apartheid uh, uh, is a system of governance that was implemented by the new nationalist government of the, which for the first time united the Afrikaners within the, in, in political terms, within the Union of South Africa, took power in 1948, uh, committed to a program of white dominance, and white dominance through very strict control over the movements and rights, and or lack thereof, and uh, operations of the black majority of South Africans. Uh, in effect, uh, without going into all of the different laws that governed uh, uh, the relations between black and white, some of them were particularly horrendous. There, for the first time, was a system of racial classification that explained how you were white, how you were of mixed race, how you were of, um, African, and how you were Asian, although how those who designed the system could have known is another story, but these, these governed in a very brutal and egregious way the relations between the different uh, races. So did uh, uh, statutes uh, governing the uh, ability of uh, people from different racial groups to, to marry or to be with one another socially. And you get up to seven years in prison for having sexual relations with someone of another, uh, of another race in South Africa. The most brutal series of racial statutes of and a whole other series of statutes controlling the movement around the country of, uh, of blacks and uh, uh, coloreds and Asians. Uh, uh, coloreds, again, let me repeat, is a term used, C-O-L-O-U-R-E-D, by the uh, Afrikaners uh, to refer to mixed race, people of mixed race origins. Uh, all of these statutes designed to establish a more systematic pattern of controls on the population than uh, certainly it had ever been known in a country that purported to uh, uh, retain a, a number of, uh, of, of democratic features for at least its white minority. Um, in essence, the strategy of the, of the supporters of apartheid assumed that you could deal with the problem of controlling the African, keeping the African majority subordinated in one of two ways. Uh, you could not move toward a total policy of exclusion. Uh, which is uh, what I, I suppose the purists wanted. Let's establish homelands, as they call them, for, Af uh, for black Africans, and let's simply ship them all back to their various homelands. Um, and uh, to a very substantial extent, this was done. And eight million uh, Africans which, who had had South African citizenship were deprived of that citizenship, and uh, millions among them uh, shipped into these homelands. Uh, which are not economically viable, which are not nations, no matter what the Afrikaner government says, and which are basically a kind of parody of nationhood. Um, for millions of others, it meant living on the margin, often quasi-legally or illegally, on the fringes of white cities uh, while working as domestics or industrial workers and the like. The problem that the Afrikaners faced, other than demography, other than the huge growth in the black, the black African population, was that they were confronted with an effort to engage in this, this uh, paranoid movement back into the, into the mythic past, as they saw it, of their, of their own people, at the very moment that the economic and social realities of South Africa were moving in the other direction, in the direction of urbanization, in the direction of industrial development, in the, uh, all, all of which required a larger and larger working class, which whites simply could not supply. So blacks became an increasingly predominant portion of that working class, therefore more difficult to control as they gained in education, as they gained in skills, as they gained in self-assurance, and above all else, they certainly were not doing this in tribal entities. They were doing this as individuals. So you find, uh, you find uh, these uh, elements bumping up against one another, and they have been bumping up against one another for the last 40 years of South African history. 
It's my understanding, too, <laughs> that under this system that blacks who, uh, Africans who are not in the, the townships that are a great distance from the urban centers, and they work in urban centers, uh, yet they were required to leave those centers to uh, areas nearby for, and they had to carry passes and so forth, and, it, and it, at even at times that uh, they could not be out at night and so forth. Oh, the horror stories are legion. The separation of families, uh, husbands and wives not being allowed to live together. The husband might be an industrial worker. He had to live alone while his wife and his family lived in the tribal homeland uh, of uh, uh, truckloads of thousands of blacks, and eventually this turned out to be millions, just simply being dumped in no man's land without economic resources in the middle of nowhere and told they were back home when they were with their tribe again, and of course they'd never even been to most of these places, but there they were, uh, there the government was, living out the fantasy that it was cr recreating the, the tribal structure, which of course it wasn't doing, and it knew it wasn't doing. So it, it betrayed a, an extraordinarily brutal cynicism about this process that uh, uh, often was virtually unrestrained. One final question in this area. It's also my understanding uh, that in recent times the government policy has somewhat changed, and I wonder if this is uh, to placate those who have put great pressure on South Africa, that they have uh, lessened some <coughs> of the restrictions on both the Asian mm -hmm. population and the colored population, since they're a small minority, uh, and given them more rights and uh, participation in the political process than the black Africa. Well, without a doubt, within the framework of the Afrikaner camp, uh, the government of P.W. Bota represents the most reformist that any Afrikaner government has ever become. They have announced, they have uh, withdrawn the so-called pass laws, whereby all black Africans had to carry passes, and instead now everybody in South Africa will have to carry an identity card. But they've done it in such a way that they leave the system of control intact, more or less. So they still have the same powers and oversight in this regard. They have um, allowed people, millions, to begin moving back from, uh, 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 to stay in the uh, urban areas rather than moving back into the tribal lands. They've kind of brought that policy of pushing people into the tribal lands to a halt. And most importantly, Bota campaigned in 1983 on behalf of a new constitution, a so-called reformist constitution, in which for the first time the Asian uh, community and the uh, colored or mixed race community were allowed assemblies that retain a subordinate status to the white assembly, but at least provide a certain kind of corner of governance for those communities. It, it should be said that a majority in both communities seem to have rejected that effort at uh, at tokenism, uh, because obviously political power is retained by the whites uh, under this new structure. The, gover the Constitution was approved, and that's the Constitution under which South Africa now uh, operates. But blacks were excluded completely from even the slightest, uh, most token share of governance in this process. Dr. Sullivan. Recently, uh, <coughs> church leader Alan Bosak came to this country and visited with George Schultz uh, about the problem of uh, disinvestment. and in particular the problem of General Motors uh, uh, selling now to white South Africans. I, I think uh, Dr. Bosak argued that, that the United States should try to use its influence to get American companies to sell out now to black groups. Uh, mm -hmm. is, that, is that feasible? Is that possible? Is that something the United States government should be uh, doing? Um, obviously, if, if the black entrepreneurial groups existed to take up this slack, I assume that uh, uh, a General Mo Motors for its own publicity purposes would much prefer to sell to a, a mixed race group at the very least, to a, bi a multiracial group, than to a group of uh, typical either Afrikaner or English speaking uh, South African entrepreneurs. Uh, I have not uh, been informed of any major case in which an American company has sold out or has sold their, their, uh, their, their holdings in South Africa to a, any group in which blacks have been significantly represented which speaks to the state of black entrepreneurship at this point in South Africa after uh, decades of repression. Uh, at the same time, the idea is a, a certainly a good one and should be encouraged. There is a dilemma here now. Uh, on the one hand, you're saying to these companies, well, you'd better leave and, and uh, we, we don't want you around any longer. This, we're we're going to pull down this, this whole structure. Uh, but what happens if, if uh, the black entrepreneurs themselves within the South Africa, let's assume you found that group. They took over General Motors South Africa. They made a go of it. It was just one, working wonderfully, using the Sullivan principle still, and for, for your audience, are the f principles of fair treatment of all workers, including black workers, devised by Reverend Leon Sullivan, in this country, and accepted by a majority of American companies working there. Let's assume the whole thing was working. Would you not then be offering evidence that 
there is some connection between economic progress for blacks in South Africa and potential political gains. I mean, it seems to me that uh, Reverend Bosak's uh, argument is bumping up against one of his other arguments in connection with this investment. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about the South African foreign policy. Uh, <coughs> Uh, in general, I know that's different in terms of different different countries, but in general, it seems to be uh, somewhat uh, destabilizing. Uh, should the United States be engaged cool. in trying to to uh, pressure South Africans uh, in in their own foreign policy to make some uh, serious changes? I don't know if I'd call it destabilizing. I would say that South African foreign policy aims at hegemony in all of Southern Africa and any other part of Africa that it feels strategically or economically valuable to it. If that means that it's got to send uh, military expeditions into uh, uh, Zambia or into uh, uh, Lesotho or into Mozambique in order to take out what it thinks are ANC and uh, African National Congress installations and training camps there, if that means that it's going to send uh, uh, its regular army troops into Angola to assist uh, Jonas Savimbi's forces, it will do what it thinks the best are in its own best interest in that part of the world. It considers itself uh, practically sovereign, if you will, in, in that part of Southern Africa, which is a formulation that was used in the Theodore Roosevelt administration for the United States in the Western Hemisphere, the Roosevelt Corollary. Uh, what should we do about it? I think we've got to get tougher with them about it. And But how exactly you go about doing that is not at all easy without becoming far more interventionist in the affairs of Southern Africa than I think a majority of Americans are willing to tolerate at this point. Richard Snyder. As I understand it, there are two European factions in South Africa. There are some people who claim Dutch heritage, and there are some people who claim British heritage. You got it. <laughs> and uh, the blacks themselves represent the indigenous population of the area. What are the European oh, claims oh. on this territory? That they're, they're a minority group in the country, and yet they claim the right to political superiority and they're making some rather strong claims. It's our country. Uh, well, where do they get this claim from? Um, of course, black, black tribal units have moved about the country a bit as well and, and uh, over the last several hundred years. But the, uh, the Dutch, of, of the white immigrants, to get to your question, the, the uh, Afrikaners of Dutch ancestry came first, came in the uh, 16th century and have remained since and obviously have a whole series of historical claims that they feel are valid for the perpetuation of a white-dominated society, claims that are quite clearly disputed by black South Africans uh, in terms of both uh, longevity and, and uh, historical precedence, uh, and more importantly, in democratic terms, uh, of, of numbers. Uh, majoritarianism, in effect, is what is, is the ultimate uh, argument that most uh, black South Africans are making and for a change of governance in which they would, they, uh, there would be a one-man, one-vote uh, uh, majoritarian rule. Uh, the British South African, the, Bri the South African whites of British ancestry are, have been in something of a pickle, really, over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, most of them simply uh, have not had the passion for sustaining the apartheid system that the Afrikaners do. The Afrikaners, remember, say that if you're really going to sustain this, you've got to be an Afrikaner. And if you're a Brit, you have to learn to live and speak and think in Afrikaans in, in their language. On the, and so you find a disproportionate number of those who have opposed apartheid from within the white community coming from within the British community. Until recently, now that's changing. South African, uh, the Afrikaner churches, the universities uh, have become hotbeds of uh, support for dramatic, rapid change. Now, very few whites in South Africa want to see that change uh, representing violent change in which white South Africans would be expelled, in which their properties would be taken, in which the whole thing would be would take a revolutionary course. Uh, for the moment, I think what we have in, existing in South Africa is a situation so fluid, it's an awful word, but it applies in this instance, so fluid that there is an opportunity for creative diplomacy from the outside in trying to serve as interlocutors between the different factions and groups within the country. And you, you have brought up something about the transition, and I was shocked this morning to hear you mention who's thinking about transition, and I had to confess it was not me, oh. and that, that transition is a very painful uh, process. I'll, I'll tell that story. That may be a good way of, uh, of, of Perhaps uh, well, I'd be happy to answer more questions, but of wrapping up this discussion, uh, uh, 
a new senator of the United States, a strong supporter in another legislative incarnation of disinvestment, of sanctions, of very strong policies toward the government of South Africa, uh, mentioned to me in a discussion several weeks ago that uh, the senator had uh, woken up one night and middle of the night and a bit of a nightmare because of realization that if P.W. Bota left the country tomorrow, if the strongest defenders of apartheid left tomorrow, if the whole system was just ready to collapse like a house of cards, uh, there would have been virtually nothing done uh, in the way of preparation by those forces, political, economic, uh, cultural, within South Africa, of all races, to prepare for a transition, toward a rapid transition toward a multiracial democratic society. The proposals are not in place. There are the institutional concepts are not uh, uh, designed. They're certainly not going to pick up on the on the, uh, the, uh, the constitution of the apartheid regime. The the sense of what type of structure would be appropriate has not really been thought through very carefully at this point. And this particular senator thought it might be a heck of a good idea if the United States and other Western friends of South Af of what could be future South African multiracial democracy gave a bit more thought toward the modalities and procedures by which this might occur than we have up to now. Dr. Weinstein, we have two or three minutes left and okay. something else that you dealt with today that I think is very important and that has to do with uh, the exports and uh, the services that South African government provides other African governments and you indicated that steel production was about 80 percent and, and the rail transport and food and so forth. If the South African government was to collapse today and a system is not in place and mm. the economy was to collapse, what would that do to these uh, neighbors of South Africa that depend upon uh, this economic trade and transportation? Well, it depends on, uh, on who took over and what happened to the resources. I suppose if a black government uh, uh, or a predominantly black government took over in South Africa, it would be relatively sympathetic toward maintaining existing patterns of trade and transportation uh, within the region, perhaps even more sympathetic. South Africa has used this, after all. They've cut off access to rail lines. They have uh, manipulated trading relations. They have suddenly blocked uh, transportation of goods from border to border in order to exert economic pressure on its neighbors. That presumably would stop in a different kind of uh, regime. Um, the, the basic question, I suppose, in, in that part of the world, people have, we've been asking the apocalyptic ones, and, and, and quite properly so, what would happen if some massive civil war occurred, and uh, how long would it take, well, how would it end up, and so forth. We have not, I think, been as aggressive in our pursuit of the non-apocalyptic answers, and a asking ourselves exactly how we can utilize, take Reverend Bosak's point, maybe there are more imaginative ways in which we can get assistance to black uh, workers in South Africa, to fledgling black and, and mixed race and Asian entrepreneurs. Maybe there are ways of, uh, <coughs> of strengthening the anti-apartheid forces politically, economically, culturally in that uh, uh, beleaguered country that we have not yet begun to explore. So sorry to interrupt. We're out of time. And sure. Uh, Dr. Weinstein, on behalf of our panel and our staff, thank you very much. It's been excellent and most informative, and we appreciate your visit to our campus. Thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Dr. Alan Weinstein, who is the president of the Center for Democracy in Washington, D.C., and discussing South Africa. We will continue these programs with other guests in the following weeks. Please join us. Until then, have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at the same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by an NIC student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.